online, so it's searchable easily. Um, but for example, of how much material that I still have, uh, and again, I have to do it slow process, but for example, this is my folder of just Fuji's material. Like, yeah, this is just like Most negatives, things, eh? slides. Like this wow. is all Fuji material. So give you perspective of how thick this is. Popular book passage, uh, shout out to Sweet Pip, I just bought this the other day, hard copy, hard to find. But look how much years of history I still got to scan. Like there's a few things like, yes, I've definitely scanned, you know, you know, the picture of the Fuji I posted yesterday, you know, I've, I've scanned it, but I didn't have the eye, even when I started scanning to put, understand color balance. This is stuff I've learned along the way, like balancing color. Like how do you bring out skin tones? How do you get out? How do you not make a picture look old? Like that's the key to it, you know? And it's not like this photo magic, but it's just like the actual image, you know, uh, let me see if I can find something random. So here's an example. So. Um, this is not the actual picture, but it's one of the sets of the picture. Uh, so um, this is kind of backwards. Let's see if this will actually work. You may or not be able to see it. Probably not. Uh, where's my camera? No, yeah. it's not going to work. But anyway, my point is this is a image. I'm trying to show you guys properly. Uh -huh. I'll figure it out. Anyway, this is a slide of Lauren Hill. Like this is just one. It's not the main hallway shot that I use uh, as a part of the Broad and Exposure Fine Art Collection. But this is just one frame that you literally have to scan it, put on the oh. scanner, zzz, zzz, scan, you know what I mean? Then after you scan it, you have to touch, like go in Photoshop, go in Lightroom, go in Photoshop, give yourself a couple days that you, so you can go back and look at it again. Like, oh, let me adjust this, let me adjust that. Give yourself a few more days, let me adjust. So that's just one frame. So again, this is from 1993 to 1998. And there's still, I actually have a separate folder of certain Lauren images in a different folder. But again, this is just one subject of just the Fujis. You know, we're not talking like my Wu-Tang folder. We're not talking, uh, the root, like I have a roots folder. You think this is big? The roots folder, eh, it's a little bit bigger than this, you know, but it's, but it's it's time that you spent around people. It's not so much that, oh, I'm going to be around them every day. No, from 365 days in one year, you know, my, like 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98. If you think about it in just terms of years, well, maybe I'm off somewhere, but my point is Every day you're taking a roll of film, 36 frames, you have to decide what you're going to take a picture of or not take a picture of. Because again, I have to pay for it out of my pocket first. I had to get this developed. Like no one paid me for this. Like the fine art that was a part of the Broad and Exposure collection, those are all moments that if you put time behind just in developing the fine art side of making the image into fine art, not just a hip hop photo, iconic, legendary fine art. That's that's where we're bringing hip hop because that's what hip hop is has been. It's fine art. It is what it is. It's American culture. It's American history. And even this past year, we saw, or in 2020, we saw the fine art world is now embracing hip hop's culture as a legacy and iconic nature. With Sotheby's, for example, doing their first hip hop related auction. Right. So it's just interesting that Sotheby's did that last year. I didn't even know it was happening until probably a week out that it happened. I was like, I'm already working on my fine art. Like you guys have fun with it, but. There's still more I need to do. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, so I'm grateful that they did it because it said to the world, okay, now we're ready to embrace hip hop iconic culture if it's presented to us in a fine art manner. No problem. I know how to do that too. <laughs> so that, that's where I'm at now is presenting our culture of the 90s um, in a way that it is iconic, that it is uh, legendary, that it is true culture that can be shared between the hip hop generations and being able to have the narrative to talk about the moments and uh, be able to create, you know, rare and unseen moments of 90s hip hop. And also another thing we'll get into is, is my newest book, you know, the collector's edition of rare and unseen moments of 90s hip hop, the gold book. But again, even making the books myself, again, I still had to scan the picture first. I had to write each word for each essay. No one else wrote it for me. You know, that's time, like scanning, writing essays, having your friends help you edit it down, working with the right person to really create a design to make a classic coffee table book that a family can share. And that's one thing that I've been listening, finding out recently is a lot of families are sitting there talk, doing story time with these books with their kids because it's not about profanity. It's not about T. Eric Monroe as a yeah. great person. It's about these experiences that this person, T. Eric Monroe, had with these artists, with these moments. And again, I wasn't the biggest journalist, but my unique moments that I captured were unique because of the way of how it was approached. It'd be easy to say, oh yeah, because I worked for this famous magazine or I worked for this famous I got these moments, but if I can tell you that, let me tell you how I got into this concert without a ticket, without a photo pass, I can explain to you how I did it, you know, and everyone involved will give you the respect of, you didn't do it maliciously, like you did it with good intent. And what you captured shows the good intent because now we can share a moment of, 
you know, whether it's, you know, the alchemist, I didn't sneak into the show, but you know, moments of like, you know, the alchemist is a kid, you know what I mean? Like you're at a show because this show was, uh, let's see who, who performed that night. It was Rage Against the Machine, uh, Cypress Hill, and House of Pain and Biohazard may or may, and Biohazard was there, but they didn't perform. But this was the same night. So in that one night of you have Rage Against the Machine, Biohazard, House of Pain, and um, the Hooligans. Okay, I remember one picture that I shot. I'm like, okay, when I'm in a concert, I'll shoot a couple concert things. But concert shots are a waste of film. It makes more sense if I get a picture of Zach of Rage Against the Machine and Evan from Biohazard together. And that's what I did in the dress room, standing next to each other. Like that's relevant history. Those two guys together. You know what I mean? Or, or a moment of. Uh, I'm not sure who else was that, that night. You know, someone from House of Pain and Cypress Hill, that's a no-brainer that a magazine would run for you, you know? Because it's like, yeah, everyone can show you a picture of, oh, I'm on stage, hit me, hop it, hit blah, blah. But like a genuine moment of like, you don't expect to see this person and that person. And they're calm and they're happy to be together. You know, and this, this pictures, for example, um, I don't want to go too long here, um, you know, of, you know, like Run DMC, and, Run DMC and Snoop together, you know? And it's just like, supposedly this East Coast, West Coast beef, but yet Snoop was cool enough He's going to respect Run DMC and take a picture. And this is September, October of 1995, right after the source award. He's like, yeah, I'm going to take a picture of Run DMC. He was my legend. He's my friend. There was no beef. You know, Biggie was at the same concert with Snoop and everyone else. There was no fights there. So where's this beef two months after the source awards? If they're beef, why are they in Philly getting paid to perform? Sure, sure. You know, so it's, it's interesting. Gotcha.